Well, welcome back to the Gary Wilkerson podcast. And uh, we are continuing our discussion uh, this week on a topic that uh, we started last week. And actually, it's been it's been a thread throughout the podcast for the last several weeks that Gary's been doing. And that's on the attributes of God. But specifically, we're talking about in this podcast, the holiness of God. Uh, Gary, I've heard you say before that uh, the first song in the Bible that you'll find is about holiness. Why did they pick holiness for the first song? Yeah, it was a song that Moses and Miriam sang. Exodus fifteen eleven, is 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 the the particular verse that I like to highlight here in this particular song. Um, it was when they had uh, after four hundred years of slavery in Egypt, uh, Moses is uh, commissioned by God to set the people free. They come to the edge of the Red Sea. The Red Sea is is closing them off. Uh, the Egyptians decide to come after them, and they are, um, you know, between literally between a rock and a hard place. And then the Red Sea opens up, they cross over. Um, then all of a sudden the Egyptians are chasing them. So there's a, a series after series of their heart pounding, uh, fearful experiences to God intervening. And then on another fearful experience, uh, very much similar to our lives, uh, one event after another seems to, uh, by the time one storm quiets down, the next one's rising up. And so God is showing himself strong through all of these different conflicts that they've been through. Finally, the horse and the rider are thrown into the sea, as the song says, and Exodus 15, Moses, Miriam, and the children of Israel sing this glorious song. Um, and in verse 11, they say, no one is like unto you, Lord among gods, uh, perfect in holiness or awesome in holiness. And when I read that, I began to wonder, well, why would, the, why would you sing about holiness when you've been delivered? Uh, you know, why not sing about uh, graciousness or vengeance or thanksgiving uh, for other things but but the, the holiness well I, I think it has something to do with because it's the holiness of god that moved his heart to do what he did that it was unholy that these people would be chasing after him that it was unholy that enemies would try to overcome them that was and that there was a certain point where god says enough is enough and you have offended my holiness to such a degree now that the wrath of god will be poured out upon uh, you speaking of enemies of of the people of god this same song is is repeated in um, Revelation chapter 15, interestingly enough, uh, which is the last song ever recorded in the Bible. And um, so from first to last, what God has us singing is awesome and holiness, um, because that, that is, as we spoke about last week, um, mm -hmm. holiness is, is sort of like the sun shining on the different flowers in a garden. And each of these flowers are different attributes, kindness, mercy, grace, justice, wrath, um, long suffering, these, these attributes of God. Um, the holiness shines on all that. So when we're singing about the holiness, we're singing about the totality of the very nature of the beauty and splendor and awesome majesty of, of God. And so that song, uh, it's mentioned in Psalms as well, that very same song. And so it's it certainly seems to be important, the beginning and the end of the middle of the Bible, probably suggesting to us that that's a song, the song of holiness should be on our lips on a pretty, pretty regular basis. And as a sidebar, I would say, Here's just a pet peeve, if I can mention it. Um, I don't like going to church and just singing a lot about me. You know, I'll lift my hands up or I'm going to enter. The, you know, those are biblical things. Um, or I don't like spending a whole lot of time uh, talking about what can happen to me. Like I, I'll, I can march over oceans and I can, you know, ascend to hills. And those are all fine and I'm not putting them down. But when I get into um, the sanctuary, which is, the word sanctus is the word holy, the holy convocation of gathering of saints. I, I would like to sing about and speak about the Holy One of Israel, the, the, the song of Moses. I want to speak about his, I want to sing about his attributes. You know, and there tended to be in in our earlier church history, uh, you know, you've heard them about the, you know, the, the language of the Wesleys, the Charles Wesleys or the, the Isaac Newton and the, uh, even Franny Crosby, even uh, not quite as ancient as the others, but you know where they, where they spoke about this, or even saying, you know, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. You know, or great is Thy faithfulness. Uh, it's 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 a uh, it's uh, the ascribing to His attributes, and we're then we're also learning uh, about God in in our songs. And so these songs I think are very important, and. Um, they are also a reflection of what's in our heart. Out of the out of the mouth, the heart speaks. And so, if if we go to church and all we're speaking about is ourselves and our 
hope for our future and what we want to get out of God and the materialistic gain we can get from him and the emotional gain we can get from him, then our heart is is uh, egocentric rather than uh, theocentric, God-centered. And sometimes our songs and our sermons and our devotional life with one another can cause us uh, a, a, a shift in, in that moving from man-centered to God-centered, which is, is again, where we're, that's what we're really chasing after. That's what we're really hoping to provoke in these podcasts in the attributes of God, not just a head knowledge saying, okay, I know some more information. Or I learned a big word about the immutability of God. I don't care about that at all. What I care about is that we are actually knowing him. Uh, Jeremiah 9, 23, that, uh, let not a wise man boast in his wisdom or a mighty man boast in his strength, but let him that boasts boast in this, that he knows me, that I'm a God of, and then he fills in the blank. And if we don't know what fills in the blank, we're going to be kind of dead in our worship, dead in our uh, adoration of God, uh, lifeless in our hunger for the word of God. It, these, these, these attributes of God actually affect our discipleship, affect our, our, doc, our you know, you've heard it said, our theology affects our doxology. Our doxology is our worship. And who worships without knowing what we're worshiping? You know, like a, if... Uh, if I don't know, any, I don't know anything about cricket, you know, so you never see me like, ah, oh, you know, shouting, I love cricket. Uh, you know, I might say, I love football uh, because I know it. And so because I can speak of, you know, that quarterback or of that running back or of that uh, bomb that just was thrown. If you don't know what a bomb is, you know, you're going to a bomb, get out of the stadium, you know. And so, so many Christians are like that. They don't know about God and therefore these words are meaningless and they don't, they don't move the heart. They don't strike that sense of uh, holy reverence or it, it's not, you know, we were built for wonder. That's why when you see fireworks, you know, you're just, you're like, oh, you know, you're not thinking about your bills or your, you know, even if you have a backache, it seems to go away. You're sitting there and you're under the sky and it's kaboom, nothing blows up. That's the small expression of how we were built for wonder. And I don't think there's any greater wonder than discovering through Scripture um, the the splendor, the majesty, the awesomeness, the holiness, the 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 purity, the moral purity of God. That you know, when you learn that, that's that's to the Christian, that's an explosion of heart that you can't find in just studying about um, how to raise your children, how, how to have better marriage, good things as they are and need to be. Uh, by the way. Studying the holiness of God will affect your marriage. It will affect the way you parent. It will affect the way you pay your tithes, uh, pay your taxes. Just you become a different person because of that. And that's all. And that's why we sing this song of, of praise to God. You mentioned the song that has holiness first time it, it, we see it in the Bible. Uh, you'll find holy or some variation of holy all throughout the Bible. It's, it's there a lot. Uh, but you see this one phrase, the holy of holies. What is that? No, good question. Because that, um, you know, there are a lot of things that are holy. If, if you read the book of um, Exodus and even into even Leviticus, probably the least read book of all scripture. Uh, Leviticus is a book of holiness, um, consecrating of things, cups that were brought into the temple to be to have wine poured in them were considered holy. Uh, fringes on the hem of your garment were, had to be clean in a holy certain way. Linen had to be worn because it was the ho most holy of elements so that you don't have a mixture of cotton and polyester or whatever, you know. Uh, it was it was a singularity. Uh, and so the, these, these whole, there are whole books on this idea of things that are holy, things that are set apart. Um, and then God says, this is holy ground. Uh, this is a holy temple. You are the holy um, uh, you, you are the people of God, a holy priesthood. So there are a lot of things that are holy. Uh, the difference is the holy of holies. Uh, now you're entering into something that is speaking of the exclusivity, the singularity of the uh, the preeminence of God and God alone. You're, you're entering in now into a, a, a sanctuary that is not built for man. You're entering into, this, into to the centerpiece of God in his divine nature of holiness. And so it, the, the closest thing that we have that on, the, on earth was the, in the temple they built, in the tabernacle they built 
a holy place where they offered sacrifices for sin. And then they had a holy of holies where only the priest could go in once, once a year. And that was the place where man transacted with God. And so, so to me, the, it, what God is trying to say to that, and there is he alone is infinitely holy, but there's a place where we connect with him, where we transact with him, that take that that almost is like a, you know that little song, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein, where sinners uh, plunge beneath that bl uh, blood, lose all their guilty stain. Uh, the idea of that holiness is, is a, a fountain filled with blood. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's the cross. It's the work of Jesus Christ. That, that Christ then... These other things, the, the, the lamps and the lampstands and the ground and the temple become holy, not because they are holy in themselves, but because of what they are now washed by or attached to. And so I'm not holy because I've got more moral and I lie less and I steal less. Um, I, am, I am righteous now because the, the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed me from all that and washed me. And now I am uh, a new person in Christ. So the Holy of Holies stands apart from... From that and that that would be I say the exclusivity of God and it's important we mark that so that we never begin to uh, you know the the fall of Satan was pride because he began to think I'm probably as holy as God is and so having a holy of holies in our life keeps us from the pride of thinking I've got it made I'm holy now I'm righteous keeps us from that pride of comparing ourselves to others as the Pharisees did, I'm more righteous than you. I'm more holy than you. I I pay tithe, I'm mint and rue and everything. So it it um it it keeps us humble, and it, and it keeps us honoring uh, the the high and lofty nature of God Himself. You mentioned last week uh, in the podcast that uh, God's holiness has a an impact on all of His other attributes. Uh, how are they attached? How does that work? The um. The 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 the, uh, the idea behind it is is called the simplicity of God, which when I first started studying this, I thought it was a rather poorly chosen word, like God was a simpleton or uh, like a, a single cell molecule is considered simple, and so the word simplicity doesn't sound right. But as you begin to study it, it begins to make sense um, in this in the fact that there's there's not only a duality in you and I, there's you know a triality or a quadrality. There's there's all kinds of elements within the human being that are conflicting with each other. I want to love you, Bob, but I'm mad at you. Uh, I, I, want to, uh, I, want to, I want to really consider my wife above myself, but I really would like to watch that TV show tonight. So I'm always in conflict. Uh, the singularity of God is that he's never in any conflict. So he's not there in heaven going like, uh, should this be a week of wrath or mercy? Uh, he, everything, as a matter of fact, um, I think it's a, 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 a writer named David Wells um, really argues that there are really no attributes of God. I, I think this is kind of weird, uh, but that we the God is is all things at all times wrapped up in everything in one thing, and so He may do something, but it's not really an attribute. It's just God being God, and 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 so this singularity is is is, is God doing what God does because he's God and, and we're not. So I don't know if that, I'm not sure that really hits the, I'm not sure I really answered your question or not. I kind of yeah. <laughs> started talking about the simplicity of God and how, how important it is that he's, he's, um, so, so how his, work, his, how his, work, his other attributes, yeah, how they show up. This is, is what um, illuminates all these other visions we have of God. We, we see the vision of God and his purity and it's the holiness that's making that a reality. So, and again, if if the word holy could not be put before all these other attributes of God, it's a very dangerous thing. So God could be powerful. Well, Adolf Hitler was powerful, mm -hmm. uh, but he wasn't holy, H-O-L-Y, in his power. He was corrupt in his power. Um, and the closer you get to God, you become less like a Adolf Hitler and more like maybe a Winston Churchill, for instance, moving towards holiness. Um, God is the only one then on that infinite scale moves to perfect holiness. Uh, but, but uh, yeah, so, it, um, or love, you would think love could be anything other than holy, but there are some types of love 
yeah. that are self-motivating. Um, I'm going to show you love and maybe some some aspect of it is actual genuine love, but it's a mixed motive. I, I want something back in return. If you don't give it back to me in return, I'm going to reject you, uh, 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 reject you of my love. Uh, okay, now you put the word holy in front of it, and it, and it just can't function that way. It's it's perfectly flawless. It's 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 pure, and so it it um, you know unless you even take the goodness of God, if it wasn't holy, it could be good in the sense of. Well, you know, this person needs that. They need money, so I'm a good God, so I'm just going to keep them giving money every week, even though that good God sees them using that money to to buy alcohol and, and get themselves stone drunk every night. Well, then the holy God in his goodness now looks at that through the different lens and sees, okay, I'm still good, I'm, uh, uh, but my goodness now takes on a different form, maybe of some judgment, fair judgment in your life to withhold certain things in our worldview, we would say withholding something is not good. Uh, where in God's view, it's like, no, you'll see in my divine providence that that was good for you, that you were, went through suffering. I withheld, you might be praying, don't let the judge sentence me for DUI, you know, for my th third DUI. God, please be good to me. Well, his holy goodness might be, no, you need to spend the next year in a new discipleship program called the local prison, you know, and, and, uh, and I mean, that seemed good to us, but that's that's holy goodness, if that's how God's. Now, maybe that God sees that person as the best thing for them and his divine providence would be to, to let them go free, knowing that their heart has changed or that mercy would, uh, you know, kind of the let mis type of thing, like, you know, excusing the sin, uh, so to speak. Um, and so God in his goodness, he can act good. But if it wasn't holy, that goodness could take a more of a human form and be corrupted. You know, it seems almost wrong to talk about uh, man when discussing the attributes of God. But are there some attributes that uh, required man for us to to recognize them and see what they are? Um, are that required of us to? Did uh, in other words, did uh, did God need to have man? Did he need to create man for some of these attributes to be seen? Right. Yeah. That, you know that um, I would not say God needed man because uh, that puts God in a place of being less than uh, full in himself or whole in himself. Uh, so, so I think, uh, the, you know, the Bible makes it clear that God doesn't need anything from us. You know, can we lend to God? Can we give him wisdom? Can, can we give him counsel? Um, you know, so he's not a God that he needs us like that. Mm -hmm. But he is a God who, in his own uh, passions, if you will, uh, I believe desires to make the fullness of himself known. And there are certain attributes that would not be known if he had not created in his wisdom. Again, there's a holy wisdom. Let me create uh, being in my likeness uh, that therefore I could show certain attributes of love that maybe the Trinity doesn't show in, in a certain way. And also there are certain things that that man in the foreknowledge of God, he knew that that creation would rebel. Mm -hmm. He saw that and yet he still went ahead with creation knowing that he was going to get to show certain aspects of his character for his own glory. And so he would, mm -hmm. um, without creation, I'd, you know, if he hadn't created the angels, there would never have been a Lucifer and he could never expel them from heaven, showing his justice, his judgment, or his wrath, um, mm -hmm. his forgiveness. Um, I don't know if I classically call forgiveness an attribute, but it's an aspect of his goodness or his love or his grace and mercy. Mm -hmm. So it's shown in forgiveness that, you know, God would never need to forgive the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit forgive Jesus. So the Trinity didn't need forgiveness. Uh, but yet, interestingly enough, even before there was a creation, those attributes were in God. He didn't come along later and say, now I'm going to invent a thing called forgiveness. Or now I'm going to, what's this feeling I have? I'm, I'm kind of upset at these creations. I'm going to, oh, let's invent wrath. He didn't do any of that. That was already, isn't that weird? It was already contained within him. For I don't know how many, you know, there, you know, we we can't grasp time, uh, the timelessness of God, uh, but there was a certain time where we didn't exist, and therefore wrath had no uh, target, so to speak, mm -hmm. and yet it was still uh, in the very nature and character of God because He's unchanging; He's not adding any attributes, and so I think it's pretty awesome to know that. Uh, let's let's put a time on it, even though this is not reality because God is infinite in time. 
but let's just say it was uh, 78 trillion years before he decided to create us. He had this thing in his heart all that time, shows the patience of God too. Um, uh, another attribute is shown in it. So all of these things, that goes back to the simplicity of God. All of these things work together uh, to show God as, as they are married together, marry, marry patience with wrath and see that trillions of years he waited. And then even after creation, how long suffering he was to pour out that wrath. And, and there's just sample after sample of divine revelations from creation on and even before creation, even in the Trinity itself, we see the attributes of God. And, and most gloriously, and, and I just leap, you know, my heart leaps over this. I am, I am floored and bewildered and astonished by all these attributes of God in God the Father. But then they are tripled. Every single one of these attributes is just as much in Jesus and just as much as in the Holy Spirit. They're not... They're, they're, they're one, but they also have three person they're three persons. And so each of them have all of these divine attributes. And so it's it's infinite in the Father. And, and infinite to me seems like a closed number, but it's not because then it's also infinite in the Son, and then it's infinite in the Holy Spirit. So anywhere you turn, because you know, sometimes when I'm praying, I you know, I, I, like the you know uh, mm -hmm. the books the Bible speaks about the groanings of the Holy Spirit. Uh, help you utter. Sometimes I turn to the Holy Spirit, and I have an infinite God with all the attributes available. When I need forgiveness of sin, I turn to the cross in Christ, and I have all the infinite attributes of God available. Sometimes I'm in that Abba kind of setting where I need to come into my Father's presence, and and there the hundred percent of all the. Uh, infinite attributes of God are available. And so when, when I see the, when I see the attributes of God in, in any individual aspect of the Trinity, I'm overwhelmed, but then to think it's, it's, it's multiplied and uh, it's just, uh, it's too, you know, again, it's too far beyond our ability to comprehend. And yet it's important to us. Uh, that's why God revealed it. If it wasn't, if it was just a head knowledge, he would not have taken the time to, condescend to make revelation known to us uh, but he has he has become he could have if he wanted to he could have just made himself known as father or holy spirit or jesus and later on revealed other aspects of his infinite character nature but he chose to reveal those three um of himself mm -hmm. so that uh, there, there's greater glory for him and all these things ultimately end up in god's agenda it's not you know god is for god not just for man he's not god doesn't exist for our pleasure, we exist for his pleasure. Uh, we don't exist, he, he doesn't exist to glorify us, we exist to glorify him. And so these these attributes of God are revelations he's brought down to us so that we could bring up glories to God and worship to God. And that's why going back to last week's episode, the Song of Moses to the Song of Revelation, where they were a suffering people as well, um, mm -hmm. you know, just like Egypt in the bondage, uh, singing he's holy uh, in all of his attributes. The Gary Wilkerson Podcast is brought to you by World Challenge, transforming lives through the message and mission of Jesus Christ. Each week, this podcast reaches thousands of listeners. This critical work is made possible by the generous contributions of individuals like you who believe in World Challenge's mission. Thank you for listening and supporting.